Now, um, I'm calling this message, Maybe Happy. So I want to make a point right off the bat. You know, everybody hopes for a happy new year. You know, that's a maybe happy new year. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm going to get it or not, but I hope for it. You know, God says in the Bible, always be joyful and be thankful in all circumstances. If you do that 365 happy days in a row, you got yourself a happy new year, <laughs> right? I mean, it can be done. Philippians 2.13 tells us the Lord is working in you, giving you the desire and power to do what pleases him. If he commands it, it certainly pleases him. It pleases him for you to always be joyful and to be thankful in, in all circumstances. And so he'll give us the desire and power to do it. Now, um, maybe we're not experiencing that. Probably, probably most people are not. But it's, it's the, we're, we all have a little joy in Thanksgiving. It's the always that throws a kink in it. You know, in, the, in the, all circumstances. But that's where the power is. There's a huge difference between sometimes and always here. But my point is, you know, we, we can... Um, when, when I read a scripture like that, and I'm not experiencing it, a command, I'm not experiencing it, um, I treat it myself as a prophecy of what God can do and wants to do in my life. That's why I look at a command I'm not experiencing yet. Ah, it's a prophetic word for me. Um, you, you know, I confess the sin, for example, of not always being joyful. Lord, I'm not joyful right now. I'm not being thankful right now. And I receive instant forgiveness. And I receive faith that God's going to give me supernatural desire and power to always be joyful and be thankful in all circumstances. And believe me, if you're that way, you're going to be a walking miracle. How many people do you know that are like that? Zero? So, um, you know, I conducted a funeral already this January. Um, so, obviously, you can have a new year that has grief in it. But 1 Thessalonians 4.13 tells us we do not grieve as people with no hope. You know, Jesus himself prophesied another uh, promise. Maybe that you don't, we don't really like these kind of promises, but it's a promise. John 16.31, he says, I promise you, you will have many trials and sorrows here on this earth. He says, but take heart, I've overcome the world. I mean, um, considering all the sin and the sickness, considering the, the grief and the trials and the sorrows, I would say that for God to go out there and command us to always be joyful and to be thankful in all circumstances, I mean, that is audacious. <laughs> for to command something like that? Audacious. Audacious, bodacious and audacious. And he <laughs> backs it up. By overcoming the world with, with wonderful promises. Um, he, he, he tells us in Romans 8, 28, you know God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and, and are called according to his purpose for them, don't you? Everything, trials and sorrows work together for our good. You, you, he's, there's, there's, a, um, there's a verse, uh, Philippians 4, 19. And, and sometimes we worry, well, am I going to have enough this year? Philippians 4.19, another, another wonderful promise where God backs us up. It says, just a, the same God who takes care of me will also take care, supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches, which have been given to us already, have been given to us in Christ Jesus. They're already in the supply house marked with your name on it. But so often it just sits there for our whole life and we never use it goes unused. Like I heard about some aid in one of the countries. It went unused, sat in a warehouse. That's us. So many times we, we see all the supplies in the Bible. It sits in a warehouse, the Bible warehouse. It never gets out, right? Romans 15, 13. May God the source of all hope. I mean, where there's God, there's hope. May God the source of all hope. Where there's no God, there is no hope. May God the source of all hope fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. And then you'll overflow with confident hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll know in your spirit it's going to be a happy new year. That's a hope is for the future. It's about the future. I know it's going to be good. So my happy new year does not depend on things I can't control going right. You know, it, it, can, it depends on me going right. Right? It depends on me um, trusting, doing God's will and trusting God to fulfill his promises in my life. Now, um, 
if God will fill us completely with joy and peace, and if he does that, which he will do if we will receive it, there's no more room. You're filled completely with joy and peace. I got no more room for fear. No room for depression. They can't coexist. One knocks the other one out, like matter and antimatter. You know? Um, Philippians 4, 5, 6 is a wonderful command. It says, don't worry about anything. Don't you wish you could obey that one? Oh, man, I'd love to obey that command. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you want. Thank him for all he's done. And you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. You don't even know why you got it. I just do. And it says his peace will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, your feelings and your, your thinking. Um, James 1, 2 through 3 is a one, or 4 is a wonderful promise and a wonderful command. It says, when trials and troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. That's the, that's the command. That's the faith. And then it says, for when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. If you let it grow, you, it, when it's fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. In other words, you will grow stronger than your trial. You will grow in every way more and more like Christ, which is going to be stronger in your trial than, than your trial is. Um, you know, you'll, your, your joy that you have will be stronger than any fear or depression that you may naturally feel. Um, you're stronger than that. And so, for that reason, a person like that, they can make their new year a happy new year, year after year. Now, um, God reminded, uh, promised the land of Israel to Abraham and his descendants, and it's a parable for us. It's a message for us. Um, it, now, God, um, Abraham, uh, it was to Abraham and his descendants, who was the Jewish nation, and Israel were nomads for a while. Then they ended up in Egypt as a nation in slavery. The whole nation was enslaved. And then the, uh, Moses led them out of Egypt right to the border, and he died. And Joshua, his protege, became the leader. So it says in Joshua 1.5, the Lord speaking to Joshua, it says, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you're the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Now, of course, that applies to the whole people. If, if just the leader is strong and courageous, you're not going to get very far. <laughs> the point is that all the people are strong and courageous, right? Now, the, the Hebrew name uh, Joshua, it's a Hebrew word. If you translate it into Greek, it's Jesus. So Joshua is a prophetic type of Jesus. So we see Joshua lead his people out of slavery in Egypt into a promised land. And then we see Jesus lead his people out of slavery to the world into a promised life. Now, a promised land you can look at on a map, but the promised life you look at in here. It's all sketched out right in here. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us from our sins, and he rose from the dead. And when he did, he left us an inheritance, and the inheritance was his life and ministry on earth, which he gave to us through the Holy Spirit. And so we receive our inheritance now when we decide, I'm going to turn away from my sinful lifestyle, you know, without God in it. I'm going to turn away from that, and I'm going to start living, ask God to help me to have the power to live with Jesus, for Jesus, and, and like Jesus. At that moment, we receive an inheritance. In fact, Philippians 3.20 says you're citizens of heaven at that moment. You're born again, and you're born in heaven. You're a citizen of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. It says in Ephesians 1.3, at that point, it says, God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms at that moment. And so when we're born again, we're born again into a new nature that's like Christ. We're also given the Holy Spirit who activates that new nature into growing in every way more and more like Christ. And that includes these amazing, audacious commands that's how a person, it's supernatural. That's how a person can be always joyful. That's a supernatural joy. They can be always um, thankful. Uh, they, can, they can experience peace when you think they'd never be able to experience it. And they have power to see these promises fulfilled in their life. It's, it's this new nature being activated by the Holy Spirit, the power of God in us. And it brings us our inheritance. Now, Joshua, he needed to be strong and courageous to inherit that land because um, he had to attack seven 
extremely wicked nations. Think of the most wicked nation and wicked leader you can think of, and that's them. He had to attack seven extremely wicked nations. Not only that, but they looked like they were, each one of them alone was bigger and stronger than Israel. The Lord said, go, go get them. So you need some st- strength and courage because if it doesn't work, you're not just going to have your self-esteem affected. You might be dead, right? right. It's really a lot of faith there. Now, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, the parallel, it says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil, for you're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. So we need to be strong and courageous. Some people really, we need to be strong and courageous because we're actually under attack from demonic spirits who are trying to keep us out of our promised life, out of our relationship with God, and they are trying to destroy us, um, and, you know, our, our entire life. Now, the strategies of the devil, I could name some strategies of the devil, and you could too, because they're used on us, <laughs> right? But for example, lies, um, feelings, sins, sicknesses, um, dysfunctions, addictions, bondages are, are all tricks of the, of the devil, persecutions from people, temptations, distractions. So th- those are some of the strategies that the devil uses to keep us out of the promised life. Now, the, the armor, Paul tells us to, to defend ourselves by putting on the armor. And he names some of the armor pieces. He names, he, it, the armor is made out of truth, righteousness, peace, hope, uh, the word of God, faith, prayer. And, and these, this armor, actually, when you say put it on, maybe another way you could say it is grow it on. Because the armor is actually the wisdom and character of the life of Christ in a person. When it becomes your life, you have armor on at that point. <laughs> and, um, you know, when, when um, we have that, that armor on, um, we can be strong and courageous so that we keep on obeying the commands, and especially we keep on believing the promises, because they can be, it can be shaky. You can be believing a promise, it's not happening. Sometimes they happen last minute. So we need that armor to go all the way and keep believing and keep obeying. Now in, um, um, so then we'll experience that promised life. Now in 1 John 3, 8, it says the Son of Man, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And Jesus destroyed the works of the devil actually by the cross Forgiving our sins, just kill the devil. We don't, if you're feeling guilty, it's because you're not understanding what Jesus did to destroy the devil in your life. Um, as soon as we confess a sin, it's over with the guilt. It says God's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all righteousness. So he really destroyed the devil with the cross, but also with the Holy Spirit, because now he's transforming us into supernatural life like he had. So the devil had all kinds of problems with one Jesus on the earth and 12 disciples that sometimes got it and sometimes didn't. Now he's got, I don't know how many Christians there are, over a billion running around. And if we all start living and ministering like Christ, what a headache for the devil. Um, (laughs) Now, uh, it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 3, Paul, Paul says, we're human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to destroy, it's interesting, to destroy strongholds of human reasoning. And we destroy false arguments. Romans 12, 2 says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. You know, that, that just shows you the, the battles between the ears. It starts out between, it's a battle over what you think and what you believe. The devil's battling you, and the, and the spirit is, it's, it's a battle right in your head. Now, um, and plus Jesus, now Jesus, when he came to the earth, you know, he did miracles, and he did healings, and he did deliverances. That's destroying the work of the devil. But notice how much teaching he did. Lots of teaching, because teaching is also destroying the work of the devil, big time. And so he also gave us the power through spiritual gifts to, um, and the mission to destroy the works of the devil, not only in us, but also for your family, your kids, your, your spouse, your loved ones, your friends, and God's friends, which is everybody. God wants everyone to be saved, and so he wants you to help do it. So help my friend out over there. And we say, okay. <laughs> Now, um, it says, in, back to Joshua, um, 
the Lord speaking to him, and he says, Be strong and very courageous, verse 7. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. He's talking about the Bible now. It's grown since then, but it's still the Bible. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you'll be successful in everything you do. It's conditional. In other words, you could read it this way. If you don't, you're not going to be successful in everything you do. But if you do it, then you will be successful in everything you do. It's your choice. Study the book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure and obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Doesn't that have a lot to do with a happy new year? You know, prosper and succeed in all you do. 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All Scripture is inspired by God. And it's useful to teach us what's true, to make us realize what's wrong in my life. <laughs> you can read about it right there. You know, we, we, we need the Bible. We need the Bible to change the way we think. The, the Bible tells us how, how we need to think. And if we read the Bible with faith, then it actually empowers us to receive what we're reading. The promised life. We're reading, oh, that's what I should be reading. That's your promised life. And if we have faith in it, we actually, the Bible helps us receive it. So that was my experience when I started my Christian life reading the Bible. You know, I'm trying to understand it, but I'm not getting it. I'm reading the King James Version. I'm in high school. I'm not getting it. But the Holy Spirit was writing it on my heart. It's, there's power in trying in, in, in the Bible. It connects us. You know, um, I, I had a friend who was a on-again, off-again Christian. And by that I meant... He was probably, I don't know, in his 40s or 50s, um, still all over the place. He had been baptized, saved and baptized multiple times. That tells you something, you know. Oh, I better try. I need to get baptized again after this few years. And he was a college grad and a drug addict. And um, he, he, so he comes to the church and he's just kind of, you know, he has a good heart, but he's all over the map. And his wife told me all about it. <laughs> and um, he ends up, I found out later, he starts reading the Bible daily. He starts getting into it. He's reading it daily. In, a, in about three or four years, I'm, I'm talking with him, and I'm thinking, this guy is incredibly spiritually deep. I mean, I was super impressed with just, you know, um, how he was. And it just shows you the power, you know, of the Bible to focus us, and as he believed it, to empower us. It, it's uh, an uh, amazing thing. Now, all Scripture is inspired by God. So from the very first day I read the Bible, for some reason, the Spirit put it in my heart. I never felt I was reading a book, ever. I've read lots of books. I don't feel the Bible is a book. To me, the Bible is a portal. It's, it's a portal to heaven. And so when I'm reading the Bible, I'm really connecting with the Lord in the Bible. I'm reading the words. I'm thinking about them. I'm not ignoring them, but I know they're from the Lord. I, I, nowadays, you know, we have to be so careful about our phones charging up. You could say the Bible is like a, hey, I found a little place I can charge up my phone. You know, the, the Bible is like a, a little plug in the presence of God that can get you supernaturally charged back up. Now, we need the Holy Spirit who guided the prophets to write the Bible. We need that Holy Spirit to guide us in understanding the Bible and also in applying the Bible to our many different big and small um, decisions that we have to make in life. So, for example, you know, I read in the Bible, be sure and marry a godly life, be a godly wife, be equally yoked. Yeah, okay, got it. Uh, which godly li wife, <laughs> you know? Um, should I, should I get this house or that job or go to this church? Or I wonder what I should say to my kids right now. I wonder, I, I remember one time um, my son had just gone off on a misbehavior binge and he's walking up to me while I was away and he was in trouble at school, which had never happened. He's walking up to me and I'm asking the Lord, Lord, is it mercy or judgment? What do I do? Mercy or judgment? I can't read that in the Bible. The Bible says Discipline your children, and it says, have mercy. The Lord told me, in this case, have mercy. And I took him to have ice cream to reward him for his bad behavior. I'm thinking, man, <laughs> this can't be good. I thought, well, maybe he'll spill his guts. No, he didn't say anything. But after we're done, he says, thanks, Dad, I needed that. <laughs> Only the Holy Spirit knew. <laughs> now, um, Joshua led Israel... Well, let me put it this way, too. Also, I want to mention the Bible. Not only do we need the Bible, but we, and not only do we need the Holy Spirit, but we need the church. 
And we also need spiritual friends. And all of this together, because I've seen people, you've seen people go way off from the Bible, way off from the Holy Spirit. They need a good church to tell them, hey, come to your senses. Whack, whack. You know, um, or a spiritual friend. Hey, it's me you're talking to here. You know, so we don't veer off to the left or veer off to the right, which we're prone to do. Um, now, uh, Joshua led Israel into their promised land, and they actually took the promised land, but there were some Canaanites that were extra tough. Some of them had superior technology. They had iron wheels, and we don't, you know, they got stuff we don't have. Others were just maybe more determined and skillful and tough. And so the point is, they got their land, but they had bad neighborhoods now, and they couldn't get them out. And the Lord warned them, don't try and live with these people. They're extremely wicked. You need to get them out of your land. Don't settle down. But they lost their strength and their courage. Wow, they're really tough. We're afraid if we go against them, you know. And so what they end up doing, they ended up settling down with them. And just what God said would happen, happened to them. God said, if you do that, they're going to harass you, and you're going to, and they're going to, you're going to end up like them. And that's exactly what happened. And so the devil used these wicked people to destroy them spiritually because he just made them like them. They intermingled. And then also they began harassing Israel physically and, and some killed people physically. And so that's also a spiritual picture for us. And the spiritual picture for us is what happens if we quit growing spiritually into our promised life and decide, I'm going to settle down with this promise you know, unbelief in this promise. And I'm gonna, I think I'm going to settle down uh, for disobeying this command because it's really hard. You know, and I think it's unrealistic. You know, and really, I look around at church, nobody does that. I don't see anybody else that's always joyful or never thankful. You know, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to live with it. I'm going to coexist with, with this, uh, this enemy. So we learn to live with that sin. We learn to live with dysfunction. We learn to maybe even live with addictions. And when we do that, it destroys us right on the spot. The devil has a foothold. Now, um, you know, maybe I'll have a happy year. That sounds like living with the enemy to me. It's like already you're deciding, I'm going to live with the enemy this year. Um, you know, we may not be experiencing an amazing command, like always be joyful or, or promise of the Bible. But if we see it in the Bible, it's our promised life. It belongs to us. And if we can um, believe for it and keep growing into it, we'll have it as long as we don't settle for something less. So, for example, on my, um, my back that I had, there was a time where I said, it was, it was kind of sore, and I said, you know, I think this is good enough. I'm going to quit bothering God about that. It's good enough. I have heard the Spirit tell me immediately, no, it's your inheritance. 100% healing is your inheritance. Don't give it up. I would have given it up. But I says, okay, whatever. You know, I didn't understand. Then later I understood. I had given the devil a little foothold in my back. And even though I believed for healing, he doesn't settle for footholds. He goes for everything. He'll settle for a foothold and he'll just inch it up, inch it up, inch it up, ratchet it up until boom, disaster. And so I had disaster on my back. But it didn't shake me up because the Lord had already told me I was going to get healed. And then I mentioned, um, I was fighting strenuously at this point now, because it wasn't just, oh, it's a little sore, now I can barely walk. And then the church came in, and it turned the tide. And I'm believing, it's not 100% yet. I'm not satisfied, because the Lord told me, believe for 100%. He told me in the Bible, and I believe it in the Spirit. So that's what we need to do in, in every area. We, what we don't want to do is agree with the devil um, that uh, this is just the way I am. You know, we don't want to agree with the devil over that. You know, this is just the way I am. This is the way I'm going to stay. That's, what, that's a, an attack. Right. Agreeing with him. Yes, okay. And it negates the cross. Jesus poured out his blood, and we say, well, okay. No, he poured out the blood to give us that. Let's take it. Yes. You know, and honoring his cross. And so even the apostle Paul, who was such a great apostle, he says, I haven't achieved everything. I'm not... You know, I don't have all the life in the ministry of Christ. He says, I'm still pressing on for the possession of perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. So Paul was moving on. You know, keep confessing the sin. Keep accepting forgiveness immediately and keep having faith for the supernatural desire and power to get what you're believing for. That's, that's uh, and to, you know, more of our 
promised life. To me, when, when I confess a sin, it's not about, good, I wanted you to feel guilty. That's not the purpose of confessing a sin. The purpose of confessing a sin is, listen, you need to recognize that there's so much more for you that Christ died for. And I want you to recognize that and ask me for it and get it. That's the purpose of confessing. I want to get rid of that, and I want some more of that. <laughs> and so, you know, God, God could have destroyed Canaan all by himself without Israel. And he can destroy the devil anytime he wants and all the demons all by himself. He could heal everybody all instantly. He could do all this stuff. He doesn't want to do it. Evidently, you know, it's to his glory, to his glory when these seven wicked, powerful nations are destroyed by human beings following the Lord, the Lord working through human beings to overcome evil. And in the same way, the devil, everybody knows that God can beat the devil, but what really kills the devil is when we beat the devil. That's like humiliating, humiliating to him. And God says, I will crush the devil under your feet. And so, you know, we, what are you believing for? Just let me ask you, what are you believing for in your promised life? What have you seen in there that's thought, would that be so wonderful if? Well, let's take the if out and say when. What are you believing for? And if you can't think of anything, if you don't know, ask the Spirit, read the Bible, you'll get something real quick.